We're back again with our study on spiritual gifts as we move to session 30 on the gift of shepherding. And we welcome those of you who are watching around the world on DVD and those of you who are in the classroom as we move to another gift that has to do with the heart, that it's associated with a heart of compassion, a heart of caring. In our last session, we talked about another of these gifts, the gift of mercy. And these are people who have not only a heart of compassion, but it's compassion moved to action. That they come alongside people who are in pain, who are lonely, who are forgotten. Those who are, in a sense, are the outcasts of the world. And they come and show them the kind of care that Jesus would show them. It best epitomized in the parable of the Good Shepherd. We use that as our primary example from the Bible. The gift of shepherding in many ways has similarities to the gift of mercy. In one of our future sessions, we're, we will talk about certain gifts that sometimes get confused with one another. And as we've gone through our study on spiritual gifts, there may have been some gifts that you heard of that you thought, that sounded an awful lot like another gift we talked about. In fact, you are right. So we will make distinctions on those gifts, and among them will be shepherding and mercy. Throughout the Bible, the authors under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit use shepherds as an example of how God cares for us. And that may be hard for some of us to understand because we don't have shepherds in our country anymore. Uh, there might have been a time, there might even still be a time, but we don't have any association with them. And yet there's some of you who are watching, you very well may still have shepherds in uh, your country, and it's a, an occupation. In my country, the United States of America, we would, the closest thing we could have would be cattle ranchers. Uh, who have cows and they take care of those cows and then move them uh, to market to be able to be sold, slaughtered, and then, and then become meat. Uh, shepherds would be gone from the United States. There are no shepherds anymore. And so sometimes it's difficult for us to understand their role. So let's talk just a little bit about it. The shepherd was in, responsible for a flock of sheep. And those sheep, being sheep, were dumb. Sheep are not smart animals. Left to their own, they would die. They don't know how to care for themselves. They don't know where to go get pasture. They can't protect themselves when danger comes. And so the shepherd fulfills all of those roles. He guides them on a path that will take them to pasture where they can eat where they can drink water. And when they're hurt, he makes sure that he cares for them and mends their wounds. When a sheep wanders off and goes away from the flock, he puts the rest of the flock in a safe place. He goes and gets the lost sheep to bring them back. And then finally, there are predatory animals, lions, cougars, who want the sheep for dinner. And the shepherd, of course, protects the sheep and makes sure that they are not captured by those wild animals. And there have been times where shepherds gave their life to make sure that their sheep were okay. It is the perfect analogy for Jesus Christ. He does all those things in our lives. He leads us on the path of righteousness. He leads us to good pasture. He makes sure that we know where in the Bible we can go and feed ourselves. And he not only protected us, but he also did give his lives in our place. So the shepherd is really a good analogy for what a pastor does in a church. And the gift of shepherding is associated with the office of pastor. And we will be talking about that office and the gift of shepherding throughout this session. Would you please open to Ephesians chapter 4? Ephesians chapter 4. This is one of the passages that is a main passage on spiritual gifts. And we will spend several sessions 
talking about this passage uh, coming up here in the near future. But in Ephesians 4, please come down to verse 11. I told you in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that there was one verse that was the most important verse on spiritual gifts, and that was verse 7. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. That sums up in one sentence most everything you need to know about spiritual gifts. Now, in this chapter, Ephesians 4 and verse 11, it is the second most important verse on spiritual gifts because it tells you how those gifts should be used in the body. And it actually goes from 11 to 13. So I'll read it all, but we'll talk about all of it later. Beginning in verse 11, it was He, God, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, until all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In these three verses, it explains how the church of Jesus Christ should function, how it should operate. And in a future session, I will explain further what that means. But for now, we're focused on verse 11. This list does not mean these are the most important gifts. We've mentioned before, all the gifts are equally important, all the gifts are vitally necessary for the function of the body, and that some gifts have special roles and a greater scope of responsibility. That's what's meant here. And these people who have these gifts, God has set aside and said, you have a special role in my church. And we'll talk about that in association with these gifts. The gifts are the gifts of apostleship, the gifts of prophecy, the gift of evangelism, and the gift of pastor. The word pastor actually means shepherd. So the gift of shepherding and the gift of teachers. He says, those gifts, here's your special role, prepare God's people for works of service. The role of those gifts is to prepare everyone else to be able to serve in the body of Christ. They are to equip the people in the body to be able to go out and perform their function in the body. It is as if God said, you have a special role of instructing people so that they know how to use their gift in the body of Christ. So people are served and God receives the glory. While this word, pastor, here, there's a dispute, as there often is among commentators, of whether it is a gift by itself or a gift that is called pastor-teacher, that it is linked. And it's because when you read the verse and you come to some be evangelists, and then there's the word and, some to be pastors and teachers. In typical construction of a sentence, you never have two ands back to back. There's one and that finishes the sentence. And, and here's your final thought. I'm told, as I read the commentators, that in the Greek construction, pastors and teachers are linked together. And I believe that that is so. There is such an office as pastor-teacher. But there also are two different gifts involved. And some people do not have the office of pastor, but they have the gift of shepherding. Some people do not have the office of pastor, but they have the gift of teaching. You see, all of these gifts listed here are offices. When I said it's some to be apostles, well, the gift is apostleship. The office is being an apostle. So an apostle plays a certain role in that office. And same with thing with prophets and prophecy, evangelists and evangelism, 
pastors and shepherding, teachers and teaching. Those are linked together with special offices, meaning that they have a certain special responsibility that God has assigned them. These offices, once again, the special offices, they are to make sure that every single person in the body of Christ is serving somewhere and that they're serving based on their spiritual gifts. So special roles given to people and not meaning that those people themselves are special. All right, let's go to one other verse before we unpack what the Greek terms mean. Would you go to 1 Peter chapter 5? 1 Peter chapter 5, where it's another section that the Bible, the epistles, talk about the role of an elder in a church. We know that there are passages that Paul wrote about that says, here are the qualifications to be an elder. Well, we're not interested in that in this study, except for the fact that in verse 5, Peter is writing directly to the elders and talking about their responsibilities. And Peter writes in verse 1, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed, be shepherds of God's flock. In other words, be their pastor. That is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those who are, uh, who are entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, Jesus, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In this one little section, Peter has given some very direct instructions to elders and a very high standard for a pastor to follow. And pastors have a very difficult job because everybody knows what the pastor should do better than what the pastor knows. At least they think they do. Problem is that God didn't give them the role of pastor. He gave the pastor the office of pastor and the pastor's responsible for leading the flock. It would be as if one of the sheep went up to the shepherd and goes, I don't think this is a very good place for food. Let's go over there. Can you imagine a sheep doing that? I already told you they're dumb animals. Not to mention they can't talk. But it's like, you know, the little toe telling the head what to do. It's two different things. Nobody should tell the one responsible for them yeah, there's a better way. Yeah, your way is stupid. Let's do it my way. And yet, we do that all too often with the pastor, and we don't do it to the pastor. We do it to one another as we gossip and we mumble and we grumble about what the pastor's doing. Perhaps we should think about what a difficult role it is to be pastor and how hard it is to be a pastor's child which in my country we call a PK, a preacher's kid. It is very difficult because everybody thinks you should be perfect because you're the pastor's kid. And you, it's like you live in a goldfish bowl and everybody's watching you and making sure that you don't do anything wrong. Well, pastors and pastor's children, they're people. They're going to make mistakes like we do and they're going to sin like we do and yet we try to hold them to a higher standard. Now it is true that they do have a high standard, but it also is true that they're humans and they will fall. So when Peter appeals to the elders, the pastors, he's saying you must be the pastor and pastor those as an overseer. You've been given this group of people and you are over them and you are responsible for them. It's like they are the sheep and you're the shepherd. And so now you're responsible for their care. And he says, but you should not do this because you must, but you're willing to do it. 
and you should do it not for money, but because God wants you to. And you should be eager to serve and not lord it over them. Tell them, all right, you got to do this, got to do that, you got to do everything else. But instead, you're supposed to be an example of what it is you're preaching. I'd say that's a pretty tall order for anyone. But when we look at this one phrase, not greedy for money, I don't know any pastor who's serving in a church who's in it for the money because we don't pay our pastors very well. Perhaps we should pay them better, but most pastors don't receive an awful lot of money. And so it can't be for money. It has to be out of love. But there are some pastors who do want to make money. You perhaps have seen the people on television, we call them the televangelists, who will tell us, if you put your hand on the screen, I will heal you. If you send me $50 along with it, you will be saved. Well, they're not a, a true pastor. They're one who is a sheep in wolf's clothing trying to earn money, and they do by fooling people. A true pastor, you can tell because they're, they're in it for people's salvation and for people's care. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. All right, what do these words all mean in the Greek? Well, when we see the word pastor, we're hearing the word poimen, poimen, G4166. And we, when we hear the role, we're hearing poimeno, G4165. And when we hear of the chief shepherd, Jesus, it's archipoimen, the one who is the arch supporting everyone else. All of these are both roles that are playing as well as uh, the, the gifts themselves. Some of the commentators are read believe that there is one office with two different responsibilities. That the office of pastor has one side of it that is shepherding and the other side that is teaching. That sounds pretty reasonable to me because a pastor does have both re responsibilities. Taking care of the flock, instructing them in the faith. Doesn't mean that there isn't a separate gift of shepherding and it doesn't mean there isn't a separate gift of teaching. It means because God has assign this person the territory of being a pastor of this flock, that they have the office of pastor and they must have these gifts associated with it. Unfortunately, too often in today's church, a pastor doesn't have both. A pastor tends to be either a shepherd or a teacher. In many churches I've been in, there have been wonderful pastors who are shepherds and care for their people. They love them, they guide them, they protect them, but they're terrible teachers. Their messages are boring, there's no power from the Holy Spirit, and yet they're expected to teach. And then I've been in other settings where the pastor is a wonderful teacher, but a little weak on the interpersonal skills, on the shepherding side. And it's very important that a pastor have both of these. And if not, then to make sure that there is someone on the staff to compliment them or to have an elder assist them in the whichever area that they're weak in. In Ephesians 4.11, the idea of a pastor is not just shepherd, a herdsman. There's a herd of animals and you're to care and control those who are committed for them. It also has the meaning of the office, that you are the presiding officer, you're the manager, you're the director, and you are like Christ to your church. Vine's Bible Dictionary says, pastors are to guide and feed their flock. They are to exercise oversight and to provide 
tender care. That's a wonderful little definition there because it both provides oversight, the, the uh, part where you are teaching and you are directing, and the other part where you provide tender care. And in 1 Peter 5, 2, when it talks about shepherding as a pastor, it means feed, tend a flock, keep the sheep, furnish pasture for food, serve them, and meet the needs of their souls. Because pastoring is really about the soul business. It's about soul winning, and it's about soul care. It's about the person. Come to Christ, grow up in Christ. The definition we're going to use is to guide, nurture, and protect a group of believers. To guide, nurture, and protect a group of believers. And the purpose is to care for the special needs of a group of believers. To care for a special needs of those believers themselves. The role is twofold because we've talked about this. One is caring for the church. The other is instructing the church. It bridges those two. The teaching function of pastor-teacher is to instruct the church. The caring function, the shepherding function, is caring for the church. Pastors often have a rich mix of gifts that are associated with their, their ministry. Uh, they often have the gift of leadership. They often have the gift of encouragement. And frequently they have the gift of wisdom. All those are associated with pastors. It doesn't mean they don't have other gifts. It just means that these are common gifts that cluster around the gift of uh, being a shepherd pastor. Commentators, Chuck Smith says, I believe that pastor and teacher goes together, that the pastor should be the teacher, and that those pastors who are not teachers should ensure that they have someone who can teach on their behalf. David Gusick says, Greek clearly describes one office, two different gifts linked together. Another commentator, John Brown, we've used him before, but not often. He links those two gifts together, but he says they are also separate gifts. That Romans 12, 7 just talks about teaching. And then when you go to 1 Peter 5, 2, it just talks about shepherding. He says they are different gifts that come together under one office, and the office is pastor. The visual aid that I would like you to consider using is the shepherd's staff. Now we've seen that, the long stick that has the curved ending. All right? And that is both a symbol of authority, but it's also a symbol of office, and it's a symbol of care. Because the shepherd uses that stick to move sheep along, to point in the direction we should go, to take the hook and pull sheep back who are wandering, all of them associated with this gift of pastor-teacher, the two sides, shepherding and teaching. So let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul, who has sent Timothy to pastor the church of Ephesus, he gives them specific instructions on what he must do as a pastor. He says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season or out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction, for the time will come when men will not put up with, the sound, with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own evil desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. This is a very serious passage because Paul is a pastor and he's speaking pastor to pastor. And he is telling his 
spiritual son Timothy, you are now taking on a very serious responsibility. You will pastor the church at Ephesus. A church, by the way, that was very near and dear to Paul's heart. When Paul at one point left the church of Ephesus to continue his missionary journey, they all cried as he went to the boat and he, Paul encouraged them. He loved this church and it was like he's entrusting his child to Timothy. Timothy served as pastor of the church of Ephesus as far as we know until he died. And Paul is saying, your first responsibility, preach the word. Your second responsibility, you be prepared to care for people season after season after season. In other words, all the time. And your role is to correct people, to rebuke people, to encourage people, but do it in this way. You be patient and use the word with careful instruction. And then he warns, because there's going to be a time where there will be other people who claim to be pastors and they'll come and they'll preach things that other people would like to hear are true but aren't. And that people, it's like they've got an, uh, an itch uh, up here and so they scratch it. Yeah, I like hearing that. Oh, I feel better. And Paul is saying, you don't be like them. Serious business to be a pastor shepherd. Well, I have some questions to ask you and please Consider them personally. Has God allowed you to, number one, oversee the spiritual life of a group of believers for a period of time? Number two, to look after, nurture, guide, and protect a group of believers. Number three, to serve as an example to a group of believers in building relationships and in giving advice. Can you answer yes to any of those questions? The person I talked about, Dell, before is the shepherd of my small group and he provides watch care over our group. He's done it for 20 years that our group has met. He has been there in the good times and he's been there in the bad times. He has allowed each of us in the small group to take part in the group based on our giftedness. I'm the teacher of the small group. That's my gift. My late wife was the encourager who would come alongside people and support them in difficult times. There was a woman in our group who had the gift of intercession. She would teach us to pray and we would pray for our group and for others. And there was someone with the gift of leadership and he would provide leadership on activities that we would do outside the group. And finally, there was a woman with the gift of hospitality and we met at her home. When you have a small group, everyone can play a role as long as they play the role on giftedness. But when it came time to look at our small group as a whole, we all turned our eyes and looked at Dell because we knew he cared for us, he would guide us in good ways, he would protect us and he would be there for us if we were hurt, injured, and in pain. Well, that's the gift of shepherding, so please join us next time as we'll move on to gifts associated with the hand. And first of all will be the gift of giving. Thank you for joining us. <music>